Nuclear power was, and still is, a huge topic. In the second half of the 20th century, many countries across the planet started building their brand new nuclear power plants. The Eastern Bloc was of course no exception, although in this case it is quite obvious, since the Soviet Union was one of the nuclear superpowers. Our series does not focus on the Soviet Union, we are going to focus on something different. The history of nuclear power in the communist central Europe. When were the power plants built, how many, by who, what types, and so on. While I'm talking about all of that, our city Skyland City of Altingrad will receive its own nuclear power plant, right on the edge of the map, far away from the city. I will of course talk about the build later. Let's start with some basic timeline. The very first nuclear power plant that was connected to a power grid and generated power was in Russia. The Obninsk plant opened in 1954. It was soon followed in 1956 in the UK, 1957 in the United States. Unsurprisingly, those were all countries with already established massive nuclear research and nuclear weaponry. So overall, in the 1950s, just a few civilian power generation reactors were started. 1960s were then completely different. Power plants started to appear all across the globe in great numbers. Interestingly, the first one outside of the military powers was in West Germany, the Karl plant from 1962, although, once again, unsurprisingly, supplied by the Americans. In the same year, the first Kandu-type reactors made power in Canada, and Americans built a reactor in Belgium. All of those are now shut down. Interestingly, the oldest nuclear power plant still making power today is in Switzerland, in Besnau from 1966. Eastern Bloc, however, did not see any nuclear power plants opened in the 1960s outside of the USSR, except one in East Germany. And this finally leads me to our region of the Eastern Bloc in Central Europe. Let's first do a quick overview of the power plants. I prepared this picture where we have the name of the power plant, year it first started to make power and technologies used. That will be important later. This is of course just the power plants, not including research reactors. I included Romania and Bulgaria to have all of the European Eastern Bloc countries outside the USSR. Both of those power plants are interesting in some ways, so we will talk about them later. Rheinsberg was the very first nuclear power plant in East Germany and outside the USSR, the first one in communist Eastern Bloc. By today's standards, it had a tiny power output of 72 megawatts after some final improvements. The plant operated only a single reactor, which was already a type we will hear many more times throughout this video the water-water energy reactor. So in short, WWER or WVER or VIVER. I'm gonna call it VIVER because it kind of feels more natural to me. Well, anyway, the name itself is not giving away much. It's a reactor, it makes energy, and it has two waters. What is that? Well, it indicates that there are two water circuits. The primary, which is run at very high pressure and temperature, but still in liquid state throughout the core, and secondary, which gets heat from the primary and spins the steam turbines to make power. So it's the so-called pressure water reactor, or PWR. Some sources say that VIVAR is PWR, just in Russian. Some sources then put PWR at the top and just say that VIVAR is a subset of PWR. Anyways, this little video has no ambition to dive deep into the engineering and naming structure, so we will just leave it at that. The Weaver family of reactors is of Russian or Soviet origin, therefore Rheinsberg used a Soviet design, specifically the Model 70. Interestingly, 70 is not even mentioned in the whole family of reactors. It was one of the very early models, we might say experimental, but that is probably not quite accurate since Rheinsberg operated it all the way to 1990, so quite a long time. Rheinsberg power plant, of course, did not simply pop up out of nowhere, nor was it randomly placed in East Germany by the Soviet Union. Germany at this time point had a long history of nuclear research, also because of the nuclear arms race during World War II, so there were plenty of quite knowledgeable people around. Some of those people were, of course, brought to the United States, 
at the end of World War II in Europe to work on the famous project Manhattan. Some of those scientists then went to other countries, some returned home afterwards to continue work in the civilian sector. That was for example the case with one particular scientist you might have heard of, Klaus Fuchs, the famous Soviet spy in the Manhattan Project. Fuchs, after serving his prison sentence in the UK, went back to East Germany and even became deputy director of the Central Institute for Nuclear Physics in Dresden. And speaking of Dresden, that is also where East Germany's scientific nuclear reactors were built. First one in 1957 already. So Germans, both East and West, were definitely no strangers to nuclear power. Close scientific cooperation in these fields were established with the Soviet Union and East German scientists went to the USSR to gain more theoretical, but most importantly practical, knowledge. The East German government then decided to sign a deal with the USSR to use the brand new Soviet technology for Rheinsberg. Next plant opened in Czechoslovakia in 1972 in Jaslovske Bohunice with a completely different reactor type called the KS-150. This is arguably the most historically interesting power reactor in the region, since it was not directly taken from the Soviet Union, but largely developed domestically in Czechoslovakia which alone in this time period is quite unique in a non-nuclear arms country. The main point of the reactor design was that it was able to use natural uranium, skipping the very costly enrichment process only available in the Soviet Union. If successful, that would have been huge for Czechoslovakia, as it would make the country self-sufficient due to its significant uranium deposits. The existence of those deposits is, by the way, indirectly linked to the head start that Czechoslovakia had in the nuclear research. The very first uranium mine was, and still is, in Czechia, in Yachimov, a tiny historical mining town, nowadays a spa. It was this mine from which uh, famous scientist Marie Curie Sklodowska obtained materials to conduct her research which in a way started to snowball other people and interests into the area, into the country. Czechoslovakia opened its Faculty of Technical and Nuclear Physics and Institute of Nuclear Physics in 1955 with people who were by no means new to this area. Just like East German scientists, Czechoslovaks also traveled to the USSR to closely study and consult with Soviet experts. Czechoslovaks and Germans also conducted joint research. The KS-150 reactor model was then a Czechoslovak invention, in a way, heavily using Soviet expertise. But construction of the reactor A1 in Jaslovske Bohunice using the KS-150 model was solely done by Czechoslovak manufacturers. Unfortunately, that is where the nice and bright history of the KS-150 and reactor A1 ends. The reactor struggles to reach its potential power output of 150 megawatts, it had various teething issues, some parts were mechanically not great, and apparently it was overall difficult to operate. Its fate was sealed in 1977 after a major second accident, so it only lasted five years. Ironically, I found a television documentary from the time which said, quote, it would be an economic catastrophe if the reactor would not operate for at least 20 years, end quote. The accident was actually quite serious, ranking level 4 on the international nuclear events scale. Uh, just to put it into perspective, just one level higher, level 5, was the infamous Three Mile Island accident. The Czechoslovak public would not learn of this accident until many years later. The A1 was simply being decommissioned without saying exactly why. The cleaning operations would then be sources of contaminations of the surrounding, which was carefully kept a secret by the Czechoslovak secret police during the communist times still. The cleaning operations will apparently take some 60 years. I read an interview with the A1's engineer who was asked a very direct question whether or not the KS-150 was a waste of money. He admits it was a failure and an engineering dead end, although points out that it was a huge experiment that gave scientists and engineers invaluable experience for the future, which would greatly help in constructing four nuclear power plants in the country, many more compared to the neighbors 
and mostly using domestic manufacturers, who of course also gained lots of experience. Not to mention, it was a lesson in safety, not just for Czechoslovakia. In the meantime, during the 1960s, Soviets continued to develop VWare and came up with the version 440 V230. Here the 440 means designed power capacity and V230 is the specific variant of that model. That will be important later. Some sources mention it was a political decision to use Soviet designs from now on. Of course, partially it must have been a political decision, but the pressure water reactor types simply proved themselves already and that one Czechoslovak engineer that I mentioned earlier from the A1 reactor specifically mentioned in the interview that pressure water reactors simply are better to operate. So it was a pragmatic solution back in the day to just use the Soviet reactors. Four new V230 reactors started to be built in a brand new Greifswald power plant in East Germany. Jaslovske Bohunice plant, while the A1 was still operational, started to expand with two V230s and four additional V230s started to be built in Bulgaria in the Kozlodui plant. Some sources mentioned the V230 to be a fairly modern design, although it lacked in various safety aspects. That is why the V230 quickly evolved into the V213, which included significant safety improvements according to the worldwide standards of the time. Four V213s started to be built in new power plant Paksh in Hungary, four and four in new plants Mochovce and Dukovany in Czechoslovakia, and lastly two and four in our old friends Jaslovske Bohunice and Greifswald. But these are already the late 1970s and 1980s and together with those economic struggles arrived into Central Europe or pretty much the entire Eastern Bloc. Nuclear power plants are of course insanely expensive. Germans completed Greifswald Reactor 5, the first V213, in 1989 after 13 years of construction, only to close it down after 24 days of operation. But I guess that will be part of the 1990s transition discussion in some other videos. Reactor 6 was also finished but never entered service and reactors 7 and 8 were cancelled before completion. Another four V213s were planned for the very first nuclear power plant in Poland, Żarnowiec. The work did start on it in 1982 for the first two reactors. It was paused in 1989 and finally cancelled in 1990 following a referendum. The two never finished reactor halls and other buildings are still there today. Why is that? Why are there no nuclear power plants in Poland to this day? Uh, politics, of course. Poland certainly had capable scientists and engineers. Their Institute for Nuclear Research was established in 1955, just like in the neighboring countries. Their first research reactor was commissioned in 1957, so once again similar to Poland's neighbors. But unlike the neighbors, looking at the timeline of Zharnowiec's planning, everything went very slowly. And then of course, Polish government had far more pressing issues to deal with in the 1980s than focusing on some stupid power plant, like dealing with riots and failing economy. But let's return before that. There is a Polish book, Zharnowiec, Dream of Polish Nuclear Power Plant. In an interview, the author of that book clearly puts blame on politicians and specifically on the coal lobby. Apparently, the Polish Ministry of Energy was back in the day called Ministry of Mining and Energy, which kind of speaks for itself when it comes to priorities. Paradoxically, allegedly, when the military government took power in Poland in 1981, there was suddenly an increased focus on starting building Zharnowiec, since generals saw much greater potential in nuclear power. The VWare 440 V213 was certainly not the last iteration of the reactor family. Soviet engineers kept improving the design with the intention of increasing power and safety. Next up was the model 1000 in various versions. In Europe, outside the USSR, the first four reactors of this type were planned for Kozlodui in Bulgaria, which already operated four older 440s. Only two 1000s were eventually built and actually only one of them was the only 1000 model operating outside the USSR before the fall of communism. 
Next, work started in East Germany on brand new Stendal plant, also intended for four but potentially six reactors. Stendal had almost exactly the same fate as Polish Jarnowiec, though work started in 83 on the first two reactor halls, but went slowly and the whole project was eventually cancelled in 1990 before completion. Another new power plant was built in Czechoslovakia, Temelin. Also initially planned for four, but work started on two in 1987. This time, however, the plant survived the change of leadership and both reactors were started in early 2000s, making them the only working Weaver 1000 reactors in Central Europe. Let's mention the only power plant in Romania, Cerna Voda. It's very unique because it uses a Western model, the Canadian Kandu 6. Why? There were plans for Soviet cooperation on building our favorite Viver power plant in the 70s, meaning it would be the 440 version. Romania, however, insisted on a reactor with its own proper containment building, which the 440s did not have. Other option would be the more modern 1000 model, but Romanians did not want that, so they went looking elsewhere. Romania also did not want to be that dependent on the Soviet Union, just like Czechoslovakia, Romania has its own uranium reserves, so picking a Kandu reactor, which can use natural uranium, was a very pragmatic choice. Romanian leadership was also known to be a little rebellious in the Eastern Bloc, so using a Western system was just one part of it. Four reactors were planned, fifth one was ordered by a Romanian dictator himself, eventually only two were finished, other two construction sites are preserved for future continuation. The fifth one was cancelled. And I would almost forget to mention the Slovenian or Yugoslavian back in the day nuclear power plant in Krško. It's a second example of a reactor built in a communist country not using Soviet design. Krško is a small power plant with only a single reactor built by the American Westinghouse. This time it's a fairly ordinary pressure water reactor meaning it uses enriched uranium, so it must be supplied from the United States. Similarly to Romania, Yugoslavia was even less aligned with the Soviet political line, so not using Soviet reactor is not that surprising. Now, who built the power plants? You might think that it was simply ordered from the Soviet Union completely, just asking them one power plant please, and then waiting until it arrives. It could have been like that, but it's not that simple and not necessarily. Nuclear power plant is not just the reactor, it's all the other stuff around that is equally complex. Various very heavy machinery, pipes, generators, tanks, high voltage hardware, precision electronics, an insane amount of concrete, of course. If you can source more of that at home, it will make things so much easier, cheaper, and it will create jobs and learning opportunities back home. Of course, the critical hardware needs to arrive from the Soviet Union still, together with Soviet engineers, but that depends on the deal. A Central European company, very important for building all of the nuclear power plants around, was the Czechoslovak Škoda, specifically its heavy engineering factories in Pilsen. In here, according to the Soviet blueprints, the reactor vessels were made, among many other things. There are some videos from manufacturing and transporting those, which is just insane how it could have worked. A little fun fact, Poland also ordered four reactor vessels for its Zarnowiec plant in Škoda, but since Zarnowiec was never finished, what did they do with the finished vessels? First and second were sold for training reactors to Finland and Hungary, third was destructively tested for material properties, and fourth still sits in the backyard of Škoda factory in Pilsen to this day. It is fully paid for, so property of Poland, but Poland never picked it up. Interestingly, you can even see the vessel on Google Maps, just a tiny little bit, sitting below the roof, just outside the manufacturing halls. Uh, you definitely cannot see it fully, but this silver edge is quite clearly it. There are plenty of other nuclear power plants planned in various stages, and existing plants were supposed to get many more reactors as well. Everything would be the new 1000 reactor models, of course. The plans for nuclear power were big, but the reality was somewhere else, as with pretty much everything. Nevertheless, the actually built power generation capacities are huge, but greatly vary between countries. 
Today, Czechia makes 20% of its power from nuclear, Slovakia close to 60, Hungary just below 50, Poland and Germany zero. What about safety? The Viver reactors have various inherently safe design principles compared to other types, like for example the infamous Soviet RBMK, which would only be used in the Soviet Union, not outside of it. But still, there were some safety concerns related to the older Viver 440 V230s, which is why they were all decommissioned around the start of the new century. Newer 440 V213s largely improved the safety standards, plus all were additionally upgraded over their lifetime. And the even newer 1000 models are even better in that regard. The most serious accident I've already talked about in Jaslovske Bohunice on the experimental A1 reactor, which reached level 4 on the international nuclear event scale. There were no other level 4s in Central Europe ever. Some level 3s did occur. Level 3 is already not an accident, but just an incident. One happened, for example, in German Greifswald in 1975, and just like in Czechoslovakia, it was kept a secret from public. Now, at this point in the video, I also wanted to talk about the environment, but once again, this topic got a little longer than I first estimated, so we will leave the environmental issues, not just regarding nuclear power, for a different episode. And now, let's briefly see how a nuclear power plant looks. It's actually super easy to distinguish the main reactor models. The Viver 440 were always built without a proper containment building, which is that dome that you usually associate with the nuclear power plants. They were also always built in pairs, and the older V230 simply have a rectangular building with a little smokestack. Newer V213s are U-shaped buildings with much bigger smokestacks and sometimes doubled. The two reactor halls then share common hardware, like for example railway entrance for resupply and some other things. Every single 440 reactor building looks almost identical, maybe with some details done differently. The long buildings next to the reactor halls are the actual power generating buildings, so with turbines and generators and all the electrical stuff. Sometimes this building is one continuous between all reactor halls, Sometimes it's split, like over here, in Dukovany. One exception for a Viver 440 power plant is in Finland, where Finns insisted on containment and better safety hardware, so the power plant eventually looks nothing like the ordinary ones in Central Europe. Moving on to Viver 1000, which already has a proper containment, and each reactor has its own separate building and power generation buildings. These ones already look more like the Western power plants. They kind of look more nuclear power planty in a way. Probably the best example to illustrate a difference is in Bulgaria, in Kozlodui, since this power plant is the only one outside the USSR that combines both. Although interestingly, it completely skips the V213, newer version of the 440. It uses the older 440s and the new thousands. Cooling, huge part of any nuclear power plant. All plants need to collect water and run it through the circuits to remove excess heat. So all plants need access to a water source. That is actually not that big of a deal, but the problem is then with getting rid of that heat. You cannot just dump it wherever, into some kind of little river, for example. So ideally, a nuclear power plant will be built near a huge body of water, like a very big river or the sea. So unsurprisingly, Hungary, Bulgaria and Romania have their nuclear power plants on Danube River. Greifswald in Germany was on the Baltic Sea coastline. So you can just pump the water in and then release it back so the hot water gets mixed with the huge volume of cold water outside. The intake is usually at the natural water level, but the outtake must be higher to force the hot water out and of course the two should not mix at least not close to the reactors, which is much easily done on a river, slightly more difficult on a coastline or a lake. If you cannot dump the hot water, then you must cool it on site using the cooling towers. Every single power plant in here has two cooling towers for one reactor, no exceptions in that. The Viver 1000 reactors then also require spray ponds, which are these fairly small ponds with pipes that spray water in the air, 
So the droplets cool down and fall into the pond. I'm not quite sure why this reactor type needs them, but every single one have them alongside other cooling options. One interesting cooling example is in Russia, the Rostov power plant with Weaver 1000s, which combine all cooling options, so towers, spray ponds and dumping water into the reservoir although this combination is rather rare. So, after introducing all of these reactor types and power plants in Central Europe, what exactly am I building here in the time-lapse? I decided to go for Viver 440 V213, so the newer version of the smaller, less powerful reactor, since those were the most numerous in Central Europe and the buildings of them present an opportunity to just do something different than a standard looking power plant with those usual looking domes. However, purely for presentation purposes, I decided to build cooling towers, since it's just a symbol of nuclear power plant, right? Without them in the thumbnail, it would be really hard to get the point across that this is actually a nuclear power plant. So, even though there is a huge river right here, we are doing towers. I was mostly inspired by Hungarian Paksh, since it's overall a huge area, a huge factory with so many different buildings and just things going on on the various surfaces inside the entire complex. Although I was also looking at other examples like Mochovce for the orientation of cooling towers or Dukovane for the visible underground pipes going into the towers. And then of course I took heavy artistic liberty here and there, because I kind of need to just work with what I have, these kinds of buildings and details that I have. But anyway, let's now properly jump into the time lapse. Okay, so this project, uh, just like with all the previous projects recently, got way bigger than I anticipated at first. It's definitely no ordinary factory, the nuclear power plant, which, you know, sounds obvious, but in terms of City Skylines project, I was really thinking that it's just going to be a couple of buildings somehow stitched together to make a nuclear power plant, but apparently not. Uh, I guess that it's just my fault because I wanted to have it very highly customized, as always. So I just used procedural objects a lot to really have those realistic looking uh, nuclear halls. So I just used, uh, well, I did use, you could have seen that in a time lapse, I did use once again like a palette of buildings that I considered for this project. And I, of course, downloaded Ronix's uh, Dole nuclear power plant pack and then various others from the workshop. So I picked uh, one particular building from the Dole nuclear power plant, just some kind of generic looking hall, really, and combine it with another that had like this. Uh, corrugated metal look, uh, red paint on it, which uh, I just found to be a very good fit for this particular purpose. I definitely did not want this power plant to be just boring gray or something like that, uh, you know, just like the rest of the industry in the city, really. So I just wanted to have some interesting looking facades and these kinds of things. In real life, that's exactly how the Viva 440 reactor holes are. Uh, for example, the Paksh nuclear power plant in Hungary, I believe, is painted green and uh, other ones are just different colors. Uh, they're actually quite colorful buildings in real life. Very clean, of course, not like your usual industrial buildings or coal power plants, or even though coal power plants these days are also quite clean. Uh, but still, it's definitely one of the cleaner looking industrial facilities uh, in the world. Now, uh, all right, so those were the reactor halls and the surrounding buildings. Those were a little more obvious to construct, to put together. So like I said, I just used procedural objects to have it highly customized, to have it look more or less like the real thing. Now, the rest of the area, this is where I probably struggled the most. Obviously, I cut it in the time lapse, so I basically just showed you placing the buildings finally. Even though, as you could have seen, I did a lot of trial and error. I had no clue at first how I'm going to orient the entire plant, so I just built the reactor halls uh, somewhere, then I just put them into some random position, uh, did the uh, turbine buildings, and just uh, then took it all and just reoriented it. And when I was done even with the cooling towers and some preliminary networks, I just took it all and just completely rotated it 
and uh, yeah, this is now the final position. Uh, there are some reasons for these kinds of orientations. Uh, it would probably take too long to explain them all. So, you know, believe me, this is the result of a lot of trial and error. All right. So uh, the rest of the buildings in the entire area, like I said, I was taking heavy inspiration from Paksh in particular, because, uh, for example, power plants like Temelin, they are actually kind of minimalistic if you look at them from Google Maps. So that's not exactly that great for City Skylines project. Obviously, when I'm doing a nuclear power plant, I want it to look very complex. Yeah. So I used Paksh as the inspiration because there are just so many different warehouses, offices, and just some sort of stuff going on in the entire area, even though it's pretty much an ordinary nuclear power plant of the ordinary size, right? Uh, but still, there are just a lot of things. Now, various other details, like for example, the spent fuel storage, or um, these kinds of uh, orientations of the cooling towers and the pipes going through them, I was just taking inspiration from various other places. Now, uh, this particular place that I'm doing right now, that's the main entrance, of course. The entire power plant is fenced off. It's a very important structure, so it has this kind of a checkpoint, a uh, double gate checkpoint with these kinds of guard booths, and, uh, you know, people just need to uh, stop for a check before they can uh, go inside the area. Uh, if they don't need to drive inside the area, then there is a big parking lot at the entrance in front of uh, the entire complex, so people can just leave their cars there. Uh, there is also a big bus terminal, which is functional. I built two new bus lines. Uh, one of them is going into that, uh, like a government area of Altengrad. That's where the parliament is, uh, you know, the, the botanical garden, that kind of place, right? Uh, because we don't actually have any any bus lines going into that area. It makes sense because there are a lot of tram lines, but still, I, f I thought that, uh, well, this place is obviously on the edge of the map. There is no way people are going to walk all the way here. Uh, they cannot because it's connected by a highway anyway. So I had to provide some kind of uh, bus lines. And the second bus line, I believe, goes to that new residential area, the one closest here, the largest in the city, because once again, that makes uh, a lot of sense because these kinds of places would have their dedicated uh, flats for the workers. And uh, well, since that is the closest residential area, it's, it's just logical that uh, several buildings there would be built uh, solely for the purpose of housing workers of this nuclear power plant, because there will be hundreds, if not thousands of workers in here. So it uh, also provided a lot of jobs uh, in real life, but also in the game, because uh, I'm not really sure if it's all that visible from the from the time lapse in here, but uh, the um, the demand for jobs actually went down quite a lot. And as you can see, we are starting to have some uh, medium, medium to high demand for housing once again. So I'm actually thinking, well, not in the next episode, but maybe in the next, next episode, I'm going to go back to uh, doing some housing once again. There are still quite a lot of topics that I would like to do with housing. So you know, that's fine. And we have to we have to continue doing that in the 1980s anyway. Uh, this particular project, when it comes to detailing or just making it look believable, it was all about, similar to the racing circuit, it was just all about adding the different layers. So obviously you have the most important stuff with the racing circuit, it was the track. Uh, with the nuclear power plant, it's the reactor halls and the cooling towers. But then you just need to add all the different networks, especially. So that's obviously the roads inside the complex to just link it together. But it's also these kinds of fences, pipes. Oh yeah, pipes are insanely important for this particular project because obviously in real life there are uh, pipes, a lot of pipes going between the buildings and it's just going to add that necessary uh, touch to uh, to just the detailing layer, right? That's just going to make it obvious what this place is. And uh, the railways, of course, those are incredibly important. Here I was also taking inspiration from Paksh, but also a tiny little bit from uh, Zharnovets, because uh, I think on Wikipedia or somewhere, there is actually a, a plan, like a, like a floor plan of Zharnovets uh, complex uh, with the railways highlighted. So it's much easier to follow it there. But uh, like I mentioned in the introduction, the nuclear power plants, with the same reactor type, look almost identical everywhere. So 
even the railway configuration is pretty much the same. So we have these particular railways. I'm doing the doors for them right now, uh, going into the center of the doubled reactor hall. And that's exactly the same in Paksh, in Jarnovets, and, you know, in Greifswald, for example. So yeah, these places just almost look identical. Uh, by the way, these kinds of double smokestacks near the reactor halls, that's exactly copied from Paksh in Hungary, because I just thought it's uh, a little interesting. Uh, of course, these uh, smokestacks, or sorry, these cooling towers, uh, those are from uh, from Dowell, from the Belgian uh, nuclear power plant, uh, because they are just the best looking, best looking cooling towers in the workshop uh, made by Ronix. I had to scale them down. I first used them originally as they were, but uh, I was doing some measurements on Google Maps and apparently these kinds of cooling towers usually have a diameter of 100 meters. And I believe that these were something like 140, 130, so actually quite a bit bigger. So I scaled them down, but then I stretched them in the upwards direction a little because uh, Again, I was just trying to have it roughly similar to the real life thing that I'm trying to copy. And uh, when I was doing these uh, reactor halls and just kind of looking at the cooling towers next to them, the scaling was completely off. So eventually I made the reactor halls just much bigger, but then the turbine buildings are suddenly just completely dwarfed by the reactor halls. So, you know, the scaling of some buildings here is not particularly right. But, uh, you know, it's City Skylines. So it's not a real nuclear power plant, right? Yeah, this little detail at the, at the entrance, uh, the, the atom symbol statue, uh, that's actually looking real nice. A similar symbol is, um, for example, at uh, Rheinsberg in Germany in like a fence. At the, at the front entrance, I'm going to assume. Uh, there is another symbol in some Russian power plant, maybe Rostov was it actually, uh, that I showed, uh, but it's uh, it's on the ground, yeah? I'm not really sure if it's made from pavement or some kind of sculpture, concrete, whatever. But I just thought it might be interesting. I made it obviously from the, uh, from the number zero. I just stretched it a little bit, procedural object, and rotated it so it fits uh, like that. And uh, well, it's obviously going to tell you right from the, right from the entrance where you are uh, going. But uh, you know, if you didn't know that by just looking at the cooling towers and the reactor halls, they are definitely visible from much further away. So overall, the entire footprint of the area is huge. The, the factory is huge, but uh, it, I don't know, just looking at the cinematics, it still feels a little empty. So I was just trying to go around the place, adding some details, decals, uh, little props of parked vehicles, containers, these kinds of things. Mm, I don't know, it still feels like it's missing something, but uh, I feel like I have exactly the same problem with any kind of City Skylines project, and it's just with the surfaces, because it's just the same green grass everywhere. Uh, unless I do the decals, which I try doing in here, you know, between the cooling towers, and everywhere where I thought people might just step on the grass to just make it a little scuffed, so that's where I try to put these decals, do it a little differently, but you know, there's that problem with decals in CS where you cannot overlap them, especially for videos. For screenshots, it's fine, for videos, not really. So, so yeah, it's, it's these kinds of big footprint projects where the surfaces uh, are just not uh, the greatest, but you know, overall, it's just a tiny minor detail. I think that uh, in City Scans too, well, now that, now that I think about it, I'm not actually sure how decals work in City Scans too. Have we seen any decals in City Scans 2? I'm going to have to investigate that uh, now that I now that I talked about this one. Well, anyway, I also tried to do the uh, steam effect coming from the cooling towers. Unfortunately, it's only visible when you go closer to the cooling tower. So these kinds of shots uh, don't have it and it's not related to the render distance of that particular procedural object, sadly. Uh, but still, the effect was kind of a little lame. You cannot really do the nice uh, cloud just going off into the distance uh, from the towers anyway. Now, uh, this is going to be it from today's video. In, next, in the next one, we are obviously going to return back to the city. I have some infrastructure project in mind, highways uh, to be exact. Uh, maybe we are going to tear down some old buildings for that because, you know, more, more lanes, more good. But anyways, guys, that's going to be it for today. Thank you for watching this Alton Grad episode. Hope you liked it. If you did, then please do all the necessary things below the video, clicking, writing, subscribing, sharing, 
And huge thanks to all the channel members who are directly supporting what I do here. So huge thanks, guys. Greatly appreciated. All right, that's all. Take care. Goodbye.